Dear God, we thank you for providing us this opportunity to come here and remember your sacrifice on the cross this Good Friday. Allow us to remember that it was our sin that put you there, but your love that allowed us to have a bridge to you. Allow this service to better help us understand your sacrifice and the importance of your words on the cross. And remember these throughout the year. In your most mighty and precious name, amen. Now, the verse we will be looking at right now is from Luke 23, 43. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. To fully understand this verse, we need to understand what is paradise according to Jesus. The context to why Jesus said this and who he said it to. Then lastly, how do we continue living in a manner to be with Christ in paradise? Paradise is defined by the Oxford Learner's Dictionary under a few meanings, but the ones most relevant to us is paradise being considered a perfect place where people are set to go after pa passing, a perfect state of happiness. From the Bible, we see various verses alluding to what Jesus defines as paradise. In John 14, 3, we see Jesus promising to come back and take us to be with him. With 2 Corinthians 5, 8 and Philippians 1, 23, we see the Apostle Paul discussing his desire to depart from his body to be present with the Lord, showcasing that there is a way to attain eternity being with Jesus. But what does that have to do with paradise? In Revelations 21, 3 to 4, it states, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. The essence of eternal life is being with God for all of eternity. And John 17, 3 states clearly, and this is life, being with God for all eternity, and, and they, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In this, will we, know, we will know enjoyment, as Psalm 36, 8 to 9 states, They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drinks from the river of uh, your feast, with your delights, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Now this is great and all, as we have clearly identified paradise as the place where we can know and be with Jesus Christ for all eternity, to appreciate his love, worship him in his reverence, and always have our minds, hearts, and souls filled by intimacy with Christ as he constantly replenishes us by knowing him. But the question is, how do we get there? And why did Jesus say to someone, they will be with him in paradise? Now, throughout the passage, we see the soldiers, rulers, and the general public all ridiculing and mocking Jesus about how he could save others, but not himself, and mocking him, calling him the king of the Jews without understanding and accepting his reverence. In addition, we see two criminals getting crucified alongside Jesus, where we see the passage continue. Matthew 27, 44 even states how both of those criminals who were being crucified alongside Jesus also insulted him. However, Jesus was then praying, and we see Jesus say in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. This leads into the rest of the passage, which continues from verse 39, with one of the criminals who hung there, hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. So, in addition to people in the status of power, we also see the criminal to the left of Jesus continue to mock and ridicule him. However, the criminal to the right understood eventually that Jesus did nothing wrong and repented on the cross. With humility, he requested Jesus to remember him in heaven, not even to enter, but just to remember him. And from this, Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. We as individuals should all strive 
to be like the criminal who understood the reverence of Jesus and why he went to the cross. We may all come from different places of professions and walks of life, but we should all appreciate Jesus' sacrifice and the opportunity he provides for us to be with him. John 14, 6 has Jesus answering, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Even though the criminal to the right may have not understood this, by acknowledging and accepting Christ, he has the opportunity to know Christ and be in paradise. We also see in Romans 10, 9, that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And this is the exact action that the criminal did. Even though he was equally as convicted as much as the other criminal who continued to hurl insults, there were four things he did in these passages we read which showcase his opportunity to join Christ in the kingdom of heaven. He recognized his sins by stating Jesus did nothing wrong. He recognized Jesus by which he professed Jesus is the savior with all his reverence when he asked the other criminal if he fears God. And he had hope for a resurrection when he asked Jesus to remember him in his kingdom. Now, when we look at people, no matter how successful, what stands out from the Bible's teachings in comparison to any other religions, whether it's Islam, Hinduism, or whatever it may be, the number of people we help will never be good enough to enter the kingdom of heaven on our own accord. As it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We as humans are sinners, all stemming from the fall of Adam and Eve due to the moral and spiritual condition of sin brought out from eating the forbidden fruit. Yet John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This verse is exercised by Jesus saying, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Through this passage, we have hope that Christ's love and sacrifice gives us a chance at eternity with him, where we can truly learn to love and appreciate the meaning of life with Christ at the center. Now, one thing we should remember is, although the criminal to the right repented, and he sadly passed away from the crucifixion, but we can ponder on what his life would have looked like if he had the chance to continue to live after these events. Do we think he would go back to his old habits and continue committing crimes? Likely not, right? So even after Jesus provided us hope for an opportunity to repent and live in connection with the Father, what does that mean for our lives moving forward? Now, I know there could probably be a whole three full sermons on what it means to live a life following Christ, but I'll try to give a short summary here as a part of the application to accepting Christ and continuing to live a life honoring God. Now, Jesus asked us to live following the Ten Commandments and more importantly, to follow Mark 12, 30 to 32, for loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, alongside loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus asked us to live this way, but in today's world, it's not always easy, and there will always be trials and tribulations. So what does Jesus say about living a life free of sin, even when those trials occur and when temptation occurs? In Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 25, Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever wants to lose their life for me will find it. This sounds very reminiscent of what happened amongst the two criminals crucified with Jesus on the cross, as the criminal who continued to hurl insults was saying to Jesus to save everyone hung on the crosses along with him, while the other criminal who accepted Jesus accepted his sin, but requested God to remember him and was prepared to lose his life, yet he found eternity with Christ. Now, Galatians 6, 12 to 14 also discusses that the cross of Jesus represents a symbol of shame and suffering for the redemption of mankind. However, when Jesus asks us to take up our cross, it's a little different. The symbol of self-denial is what the cross represents, where Jesus asks us to deny our pleasures and strive towards living a life following Jesus. Now, this may not mean denying everything in the world, but it means denying what leads us to sin. This is further exemplified by Matthew 5, 29 to 30, where Jesus says, that if your eye and your hand is causing you to stumble, get rid of it. Now, this is not implied literally, but rather metaphorically, where we should remove ourselves from environments, objects, and scenarios that tempt you to sin. Now, the best way to do this is to live in the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18 says, To walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, with flesh implying the world and sin. 
as sin desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and vice versa. But in doing so, we will be kept against the laws of sin and be filled with the Spirit, where Christ can be what satisfies us, as we see earlier in Psalm 36, 8-9. In doing this, we make Christ dwell among us and with us, where he will satisfy our needs. Now, we may not be perfect, no matter how much we pray or read the Bible and do our best to live by the Spirit, there will be times that we may sin because we're not perfect. But just because someone stumbles and falls and loses their way doesn't mean they're lost forever. But with Christ's sacrifice and understanding Jesus' love to die for us, it provides us the opportunity to live a life following Christ and to be with him for eternity. The four parts are in recognizing and accepting our own sins, recognizing and professing that Jesus Christ is our Lord God and Savior, and that we may have hope to be in paradise to know him for eternity. By God's love and grace, we will always have the opportunity to join him in paradise, and by taking our own cross and denying what we want from this world to let Christ fill us. We will have the opportunity to hear the same words that a criminal who initially denied Christ, but had a change of heart hearing Jesus' prayers was told. As Jesus says, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise.